On this episode of the podcast, I'm speaking with Amate Doku. Uh, Amate is a management consultant at the NAUS Group, and he was also uh, the Cambridge University Students' Union president in 2016 uh, and the Jesus College Student Union um, president in 2015, during which he ran a successful campaign to get the college to repatriate the Okukur, um, which was a piece of Benin bronze in the shape of a cockerel, repatriated back to Benin. Amity, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Zach. Good to be here. And it's very, very good to have you. I thought it would be interesting to start by uh, asking uh, what it is that you're doing now and how um, you know, you've worked in student politics for you know, a couple of years after leaving university. And, you know, could you describe what it is you're doing now and how you got there? Yeah, sure. Um, so as you said, I'm a management consultant um, and uh, working mainly um, in the higher education sector. So working with a, a range of universities on, on a whole range of issues, actually. I would say that particularly after um, Black Lives Matter in 2020, the murder of George Floyd, a lot of um, the higher education clients, as we've seen a lot across the sectors, uh, different sectors as a whole, have been in real need of support around um, equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism work. So I'll be doing a lot more of that work um, since then. Prior to that, um, as you pointed out, worked for two years as Deputy President of the Nat National Union of Students, NUS, led, leading on higher education policy um, but also um, a strong part of that was race equity so a, a real pillar of, of what uh, you know I had on the one hand I was dealing with Brexit um, was also looking at um, higher education regulation but was keen to make racial inequalities in higher education one of the big pillars of, of the work that I was doing there um, and yeah fantastic experience um, learned a lot and learned a lot from that which i'm sure we can get into a bit later but yeah as you as you highlighted but prior to that was at cambridge at cambridge university students union and um, before that was at um the uh at jesus college student union as, as well so yeah quite a, a, so you're really uh, steeped in university politics at all sorts of levels from national to to i suppose local if cambridge you know, is not really representative of, of the nation, but um, but started at definitely at a local level. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that gives you very, very different perspectives of, of how universities work, how they operate, what some of the real challenges are, where the debates are, how decisions get made, how decisions don't get made. Um, and yet, and then as a consultant now, being able to work um, with senior leadership teams to, to try and tackle some of these issues as well has been a real, uh, really mm -hmm. interesting experience. And has there been a, a consistent thread running through all of all of that work that you've been doing? You know, what what is it that that drives you uh, when you're getting involved in some of these roles? Yeah, I look, I think fundamentally, I want universities, um, as, as I want you know any organisations, to be great places to to work and and to be great places to, mm -hmm. in the case of the higher education sector, be a student. In the case of you know other sectors like the health sector, a, a patient, mm -hmm. it's it's about making sure that um, barriers to experiences for both students and uh, staff are, are are really tackled and, and and broken down. And race equity is one lens mm -hmm. through which you can start to, to to tackle some of those things. But broader cultural change, I think, is is often needed in most institutions, and, and that's kind of mm -hmm. the sorts of things that i've been campaigning on to change over over those years and, and will continue to yeah maybe that's a good um point in which to introduce the topic for this episode which is about how do we move past culture wars um you know and i thought that you know that even that phrase culture wars you know might be a bit contentious it's been getting mm -hmm. used a lot more in the media and i think that maybe just the average joe who has who reads uh, the newspaper, either the Guardian or the the Telegraph, will think of university politics and think, oh, it's all about these campaigns to dismantle statues. And uh, you know, I, I thought it would be interesting to ask you whether that actually had anything to do with the stuff that you were doing as a you know uh, as being involved in student politics. Yeah, I think so. Look, I think particularly when I got to NUS, um, but even before then, uh, um, the culture wars have always been a kind of backdrop to to the work that's 
that, that I've been doing. Now, interestingly, <laughs> uh, I, I will speak to anybody in the higher education sector, the sorts of things that are keeping anybody at any level in the HE sector up at night are nine times out of 10, not really related to, to, to what's going on in that space. But from the outside, if you were to look at the media, if you were to look at the way in which universities are being characterized, you would think that that's the number one issue that everyone's grappling with. That is, is, is a real problem. Um, with higher education so if yeah, we i suspected define... that always wasn't quite the case no no it wasn't necessarily always the case but having said that and we can kind of get into you know what do we mean by the cultural wars um it's not new that there is a perception that universities are these left-wing enclaves uh, of radicalism <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and are out of step with the rest of the world um, and uh, those on who would sort of profess to be on the right of politics see them as you know out of touch um, you know um, places um, and, and that that is a problem and that that needs to be tackled and confronted head on that is not a new thing uh, in, in, in arguably, arguably, and this is one of the things I find really interesting about the debate, arguably, there's been a bit of um, kind of collective uh, uh, sort of a, a forgetfulness, really, about um, some of the potentially, you could characterize them as culture wars that took place in the 70s, you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s, which were far more fraught and in, the case, in, in many cases far more physically confrontational than any of the things that we've seen today. Yes, um, uh, I mean the the on university camp campuses it hasn't really got very physical, has it? I mean, there's been a few protests, but but nothing, nothing uh, that you could compare to a real war. No, but you contrast that with pictures from the seventies and eighties, where you had, you know, huge demonstrations on campuses, you know, about apartheid, about um, uh, what was going on in 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 in. Um, in you know, in the university in terms of guests who were being invited in. Um, mm. I spoke, to, I remember when I was a student, I spoke to one, um, you know, one of these, you know, fancy, as you can imagine, one of those fancy Cambridge dinners, sitting next to this guy, and I think, gosh, well, you know, are we going to have anything in common? Anyway, he, in, in a lot of these cases, people would just tell you their life story. It was really fascinating. He said that he, he was a, a, a student, mm -hmm. and he remembers a time when um, the, uh, master of the college at the time so the the person who ran ran the college um was having dinner with some leader of a, of a country which had a terrible human rights r record um and he said that the students got wind of this and they basically went in they ransacked the the, the hotel and he was telling wow. me this he said he hadn't been involved in it but he said it was it's so funny he said oh and my my, my housemate who is now you know a senior leader in this field blah 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 uh, came back with a lampshade um, <laughs> and kind of back from from the hotel they completely sacked the hotel and apparently um the some of the university authorities just gave the police a list of um a, a left-wing students who are on maybe some kind of blacklist um they, the students were then all arrested <laughs> uh, wow. but then obviously released because there was no evidence to kind of back out so that is a you cannot imagine that happening today no. uh, and and also the students in, in today don't operate in that way and, and mm -hmm. don't take that kind of action um yeah. but if you were to read the press you would think well that's the kind of thing that is is both is happening today and is some kind mm -hmm. of new phenomenon which you've never um, experienced before. So you have those right-wing uh, commentators, right-wing voices criticising um, what's happening on on campuses now and getting quite irate about it, and, and you sort of going so far as like the, the likes of Jordan Peterson to say that oh well, this is all part of uh, some sort of ideology called postmodernism to kind of deconstruct everything that we we hold dear. Why? Because of you know, not really sure what their left wing ideology, and you know that's just never seemed to me as someone who went to Cambridge what it was all about. And I wonder if you could maybe put the case to some of the campaigns that you were involved in, which you know were maybe part of that same same flavor, but always seemed to me to have quite a lot of common sense behind it. I mean, what was the opposing argument? So, really good question. Look. If we actually explore what is going on here, 
there is one reading of what's happening, which is to say, in the last 20, 25 years, universities have expanded significantly in the student profile. We've gone from a situation where, you know, less than 10% of students were going to university, of young people going to university, to in this kind of post um, New Labour um, Blairite vision of higher education, we're pushing 50%, almost 50% of young people going to higher education. And that expansion has happened particularly acutely in, um, as you would expect, groups who, are, who you would consider non-traditional, uh, from non-traditional backgrounds to go into higher education. By definition, that's what had to have happened for that great, great expansion to take place. Mm. There is a reading which says, all of a sudden you've got these influx of new experiences, new views and new backgrounds coming into the higher education space. And they feel, quite rightly, a sense that they should be entitled to and, and have uh, the same rights in that space as anybody else who went before. And that leads to more interesting conversations and more questioning of what university is about and what university should be for and the sorts of things that are acceptable and the sorts of things that are not acceptable. And there is a reading of what's going on which says, as a result of that widening of the sphere, that public sphere in universities, that leads to more challenge in that space at a time when young people are encouraged to have their views heard and to debate. It goes outside of the bounds of the previous debates, which were hap which only happened with this sort of very elite seven percent, where everything was basically, you know, they were all basically in agreement on on, on certain things, mm -hmm. and actually starts to challenge even more the status quo. Um, and if you then look at the sorts of things that come out of that around having a, a what's called a decolonized curriculum, so a curriculum which is more representative of the experiences, not just of, you know, um, from, from a Eurocentric uh, white standpoint, actually more representative of um, the world more globally, more representative of minorities mm -hmm. and other disadvantaged groups. Um, if you look at the calls for uh, consent classes, it's about saying that actually, you know, this is an environment that needs to be safe for everyone mm -hmm. and you know women students in particular need to have that safety that previously frankly wasn't seen as, as a priority for perhaps for the student body to 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 to, to, to care about mm -hmm. um more recently conversations around trans rights as well all these things you can kind of google and find there will be an article about it somewhere saying this is just a, a, a an example of the snowflake student. Yeah. <laughs> um, when actual fact, I think, as opposed to it being um, about being too sensitive, it's actually about that there is a there is a gutsiness in actually um, challenging. <laughs> it's not just going through university experience and saying I'm just going to take it how it is. Actually, challenging the way um, things are taught and challenging the way in which um, mm -hmm. uh, the status quo is. Oh God, there's so much to say there. Like that's a that's really, really um, interesting uh, thoughts about it. I can really see how this um, sort of influx of new perspectives organically is going to change things and make it more inclusive. Like that seems to me to be sort of obviously quite a sensible thing. But um, what I I think that maybe some of these right wing voices are seeing is well, it's not just uh, organic process. I think that they are a little bit worried that, well, actually, some of this is being advanced quite forcefully. Um, you know, people are being no platformed uh, from campuses, or people are having to uh, lose their jobs. Um, you know, if they express the wrong opinion. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts about that. And then there's a a second point about the the bravery that you need to actually take part in these conversations, no matter what side you're on. I think. Because the consequences of speaking up on social media or being involved in that social media storm are so, they seem to me to be so great that no one would really voluntarily sign up for that unless they were, you know, pretty crazy. <laughs> At least I would have thought, you know, do you have any thoughts about either of those things? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if we take, if we take that second point, um, as, 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 as you'll be aware, um, I found myself in the middle of a, of a storm of this kind um again from from that viewpoint that i that i set out so 
arrived at university, you, you flagged the, the Benin Bronze cockerel that was in um, the Jesus College dining hall. Um, that had been there for years and years and years. And a couple of us came together and said, did our research and found that this thing had been stolen in the punitive expedition of 1897 um, and had been taken as loot after the, the British um, army had completely ransacked the city-state of Benin. Um, and for us, it was a no-brainer. You know, um, Since then, uh, for years and years and years, um, mm -hmm. there had been a strong campaign on the Nigerian side, um, which is where uh, the city-state of Benin um, uh, was uh, there's been a strong case for these items to be repatriated so we said look there's, there's a real positive opportunity here let's uh, take this opportunity let's you know do what we can to, to go some way to right this wrong repatriate this artifact um, and th this piece of art but use it as an opportunity to to both celebrate um, uh, the, the the art uh, and, and Nigerian art. Let's commission a new plaque in its place, um, and let's make this an opportunity to really restate and make it clear that having stolen colonial loot on display is probably <laughs> not the kind of thing we want in in our to be to be have to have in our dining hall. Um, so for us, it was, it's a fairly straightforward straightforward argument. The backlash was pretty huge. I mean, um, and it, it just sort of ticked all the boxes of the kind of. Of, of the kind of um you know straight into the to, to the culture war uh, space it was quite soon after the rose must fall campaign as well as kind of kicked things off um mm -hmm. so it was kind of put in the same bucket as that um and, but, and do you but want to just explain you know what roads must fall uh, was about for you know people who are listening who might not have heard of, of what was going absolutely. on absolutely so I'm, I'm gonna perhaps not necessarily go into the dates because i don't want to get them wrong yeah. um, but <laughs> that's okay fall, yeah don't worry um it started in um uh, the, the the university um in cape town um where there was a, a a statue of um cecil rhodes who was um you know perhaps more pre others may say more precisely but had, had was seen as one of the architects of um apartheid um uh, and, and that and there was a campaign which successfully resulted in that the statue on that campus being removed. That then spread across the, the world, really. And um, Oxford, Oriel College, Oxford had a um, also had a statue of him. And there was a huge campaign on their campus, which has been going for some years now, um, to have that statue removed. I would say that that campaign has really sparked off. Um, there are different strands to the culture wars. There are different elements of the free speech bit. There's the trans rights bit there's the um even the sort of the the gender um inequality element of it uh, the, the the sort of the race and the decolonizing element i would say really had its roots in the, in the rose must fall campaign mm -hmm. um in around about 2015 2016 in the uk so this campaign that i was involved in was was sort of around about that around about that time, 2015, mm. 2016. Um, so it was right in the aftermath of that. And it was seen as seen as sort of part of that. And I guess it was really interesting because from our point of view, it was, A, it was a no-brainer. And B, we thought there's a really positive story we're trying to tell here, which is mm. that we can face up to our past and we can do something uh, to restate and make it clear mm -hmm. that this is a space and an environment which can include everybody. Uh, and it goes back to that point that I made in the mid '90s, when there were no, there were very few diverse people, you know, entering those kind of citadels of learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why would anyone go out of their way to, you know, campaign about something where they don't have that, you know, real link? For somebody, you know, I'm not Nigerian, but it was, it, I, there was a personal connection there, seeing yeah. um, something that was taken from a country which wasn't too far from from where my heritage is, and saying, actually, I don't think that's. I don't think that's right, and that wouldn't. I don't, don't that think that belongs either. here. <laughs> quite, quite, yeah. quite. So, why do you think that your campaign was successful, whereas the Rhodes uh, Must Fall campaign at Oriel College, Oxford, wasn't? You know, the statue's <laughs> still standing, and also everybody's up in arms. I think all of the all of the wealthy people who wanted to donate to the college said that they would pull their millions of pounds of donations if they removed it. But why yeah. did they get such a negative? reaction but actually you've your campaign managed to work things out so i would say that there, there were some particular nuances around um the the two different campaigns 
and then there's one which is a very obvious personnel reason. <laughs> so um, one was with with um, in terms of the the nuances of the campaign, ours was slightly different. The Rose Must Fall campaign was about removing uh, a statue which symbolised. Uh, and kind of depicted um, Cecil, Cecil Rose. Um, and that was about saying, we think that statue being up there is um, you know, celebrating this figure. Uh, and we don't think individuals like that should have that prominence and have, have that, cel- you know, in that in that celebration. On the other side of the argument that people were saying, no, if you take that down, you're erasing history. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's yeah. It, you know, we, we need to. I, mean, I can talk about that in a second. But but we need to. We need to. We need to come to terms with our past. But we can't deal with our past. We just erase history. Ours is slightly different because ours was an actual um, stolen good. <laughs> yeah. So so actually, that, the argument was slightly harder because it wasn't actually about quote unquote erasing history. It was taking giving something back that wasn't ours in the first place. Uh, and, and again the act of doing that was to some extent more of a positive act as opposed to just taking something down in theory but interestingly that didn't happen at 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 the university until it didn't get returned until uh, there was a new the change of leadership we had the first black woman to lead uh, um, an oxbridge college come into post and she um you know saw that actually you know, obviously, this isn't something that we should have. Took on the recommendations of the working group that had been set up to look at, at it, and pretty swiftly organised for it to be repatriated and returned. Mm-hmm. Had she not come into post, it may not, it may not have happened, and that that goes into some of the other challenges as well. Whilst the student body and um, population have dramatically um, diversified, it's not been the same on the staff front. I see, and it's interesting that you can really connect the outcome to the to the personnel. I mean that that brings up all sorts of things about uh, quotas and affirmative action and needing yeah. to make the leadership diverse is is something that's really essential to make these uh, historical injustices, you know, to to correct them. Is that is that what you would agree with as well? Look, I would say there's a lot of work to do. Uh, there's a lot of work to do in building up that pipeline, um, and um, it starts very, very early. And and we've we've got a long way to go. To some extent, at the senior leadership levels, you can look to other sectors to bring people in. But you know, uh, the drop off rates from um, th- that diverse cohort in the undergrad level going into postgraduate study is huge you, the the pipeline of academics isn't just going isn't coming through yeah. at the minute so a, a lot more work needs to be done it's it's interesting because I, I don't think the the previous leadership of the college had anything really to lose by making this positive gesture of yeah let, let's give it back and uh, i seem to remember they had like a nice ceremony with the people from uh Benin where where they uh gave this back i mean that was that was quite a good pr uh exercise for the college as well wasn't it <laughs> Well, look, it was the, the ceremony was everything we had envisaged it to be. Envisaged it to be, you know, it was such a, a, a celebration, and that was actually the tone. You know, at the end of the day, we had a, 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 a stolen piece of um, an object of cultural significance. They could have turned around and said, <laughs> frankly forget the ceremony we're taking it and getting out of here that yeah. was they set the tone very very differently they even gave a gift back to the college um of, of a sort of a, a rare um uh, kind of novel of, of um benin bronze history and st- stories so there was you know there was a real exchange wow the the concern that the the previous mm-hmm. leadership had was that it would set a precedent mm-hmm. Uh, and it, they didn't want to be the first institution to hand back open in bronze to then set the precedent. Now, this the, interesting argument, <laughs> but but that that was less. And I think uh, to you know to be fair, I think that was less about that was less about them not wanting to do it. It was more about just we don't want to be the first because we're just very nervous about this and we're nervous about what mm. it means. And you know that's which is a, a, a very, very risk-averse attitude yeah. and approach. Um, and I think at the time, we didn't really engage with that. But actually, deep down, we wanted to say, is that really a bad thing? 
yeah that we're we're setting the precedent on this and it, it to some extent it has the conversation has shifted uh, aberdeen university was soon to follow after that um and and now growing calls for the british um, museum to think about it even today i got um news that the great north museum in in newcastle is is repatriating it plans to repatriate its collection of benin blocks you know so wow. if you think it's the right thing to do then you shouldn't be too concerned that you're setting a precedent mm-hmm. And um, also, it seems that there's lessons in that story for um, future movements and how they can be constructive. It sounds like you need to pick the right piece of historical art- architecture. <laughs> uh, you know, it's about the way, you know, and maybe this is where maybe some of the right wing voices are right. And that maybe there's a feeling on the left and, you know, especially the, the far left that the way you solve problems is by protesting about it. And that's not always the case. Like you have to put a lot of bit of thinking into how you're going to protest. It's not just about getting as many bodies together and, uh, you know, and and being very loud. It's about having a right the right argument behind you as well. Yeah, I think I think look, I think there's we've we've got to be a lot more strategic um, in this. But but I think the ch- the challenge is with a lot of this stuff it's very easy for the debates to become mischaracterized it's very easy for people to be speaking past each other yeah. and actually what you find in a lot of these debates debates the, the culture wars <laughs> people never actually talk to each other no, nobody's actually talking to each other everybody's talking past each other now in in, in some to some extent that is justified to, for for certain reasons you know if there's somebody who's going around mm-hmm. spouting really you know racist comments and the rest of it you know that nobody there's no obligation for anybody to have to listen to that or have to you know respond to that and 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 approach that individual um but when for example there's a there's a campaign that goes on on campus and then a whole bunch of people write in and say this is outrageous and this is ridiculous what you do is you find that you end up getting further and further entrenched in your position yeah and then the other side ends up getting even further further entrenched in their position and and actually at no point has anybody had the conversation with each other to say okay this is why we're doing it and you know this is what we're doing and this is why online is not the correct forum for that i don't think we've not found the space online to have some of these Mm -hmm. conversations i don't know where the other kind of fora are because it's not really something that can happen at a local level it's something that kind of happens nationally where somebody in one part of the country gets annoyed that a university miles and miles away is doing some action which has no impact really on them but seems to have this impact of broader identity um and you know we can get into this but i, I think fundamentally a lot of these issues comes down to mm-hmm. the broader identity crisis that we're having as a country mm-hmm. and I, um, I think we we both wanted to talk about that um during this episode um and really ask the question how do we move past it how do we start talking to each other how do we break away from this framing of it as a culture war which i think is largely you know given from the media it's you know i don't think it's something which people widely actually believe is is you know happening to the extent that it's portrayed in the media what are your ideas about how we start moving and you know to a post-culture wars era of politics yes i mean huge 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 question i think it goes back to the point that 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 i was raising look the culture war happens in the context a lot of the time happens in the context of universities but doesn't necessarily happen in the context of universities it's it is it has gone beyond that the national trust because they have um, dared to, to to write a report which looks into the links between their um, uh, their their properties and, and slavery are are then you know put into the into the cultural um, in the cultural and tarnished with that brush. So it's kind of seeping out. But I think part of the problem is this: we've got to a point, and this is talking in very general terms in the UK where and this is a bit crude but on the one side you have a younger generation who are coming in who are saying we need to talk about colonialism we need to talk about this country's past we need to accept that things haven't been great for minorities for women 
you know, in, in the past, and we need to come to terms with that. And then on the other side, you have a group of people who are saying this country is changing so fast. Um, stop talking down this country. Mm-hmm. We need to be proud of the country that we're in, and we kind of want to go back to the time when actually we were proud of this country, and we can we, we, we're very comfortable and very proud to to wave mm-hmm. the flag and to sing the national anthem and, and the rest of it. And and I and I think those people really need to be listened to more than they are being in that debate. Uh, do you agree with that? What I think we need to do is bring people together. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, but it strikes me that if we can't get to a point where we can both acknowledge the past collectively and have that conversation Mm -hmm. and do the real difficult work in having the conversations with somebody who's like this country is you know there's nothing nothing's wrong you know we've got to we need to be proud of the past we need to celebrate churchill rather than you know try Mm -hmm. and you know defame him unless we can have you know have that conversation and explain where we're coming from and understand where everybody else is coming from we're not we're not going to move forward Mm-hmm. And there are two real difficulties with that. One is who leads that conversation. Is yeah. it the obligation of the activist to to have that conversation? Arguably, potentially not, because you know where do they start? Um, but but you know, secondly, because of the level of um, polarization, mm-hmm. there are some people who who do have views which the other side do deem fairly offensive and quite hurtful. And there's an argument to say, you know, why should you, for example, insist that a trans student has to debate um, somebody who is, you know, promoting transphobic views, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's where it gets really, really tricky. And of course, there's a generational layer on top of that as well, where, you know, um, Gen Z or whatever coming into the workforce, and you know, have very different values and, and, and beliefs than, than, than other generations. So there's a generational gap. I genuinely think that unless, and maybe this is a bit of a, maybe this is a bit of a sort of a wishful thinking kind of approach, unless this is led really by the leaders of the country, unless this is led by the government, it's going to be very difficult to to get us there because I think as long as the government is seen to be um not talking to a whole portion of the country, mm-hmm. we're going to be in, 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 in big trouble on this. It's, it, I think that's quite perceptive because my experience of, um, or my uh, feeling watching Keir Starmer really trying not to talk about these issues, he's really trying his hardest not to get into yep. debates about gender identity or about um, uh, trans issues. Um because I think of the same fear of, oh, well, what happens if I say the the wrong thing or what happens if I uh, make a stance and then, you know, it becomes untenable. It, there's just this sense that this whole thing is just a Pandora's box that if you don't do exactly the right thing with it, it's going to blow up in your face. Yeah. So if, you know, if you were, uh, if you were Keir Starmer or if you were the, you know, whoever's going to be the next uh, leader of the Tory party, how would you be think? What would you be saying to them about how to deal with this issue? So, so I used to think that um, Keir Starmer was not not the, that he was doing the right thing, but I could sort of understand the rationale of wanting to steer clear of this because, um, in terms of where the culture wars kind of split, I haven't done the analysis, but instinctively I think there is a similar Brexit divide that you could probably put. And uh, sort of to some extent, just map it against the mm. where people's views are on on certain issues in relation to the to, to the culture war. So in his in his you know desire to kind of move us post Brexit divisions, I can understand why he might not want to take a strong view on these things. The, I guess the reason why I I uh, the reason why I'm kind of have moved towards the thing of actually you can't afford to avoid talking about these issues is because I think fundamentally it's a question of identity. What kind of country do we want to be? What kind of nations 
nation slash nations are we? What does it mean to be British in the in the in the twenty first century? And the current Labour leadership's approach is to sort of well, we'll just stick some flags up and kind of hope that people <laughs> think that we're patriotic. <laughs> But I mean, it doesn't sound way. like a great plan, does it? No, uh, w- because you will always be outdone by the right, who will say we have a glorious history and a glorious past, and there's nothing, and you know we are more than comfortable waving the flag. So the only way I think for the late from the Labour point of view is to be honest with people and say that we, in order to resolve this, we're going to have to have and find a way of having some of these conversations. We're going to yeah. have to find a way of bridging some of these divides i mean in 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 the states it's really interesting Mm -hmm. there's a there's a there's a campaigning technique called deep canvassing Uh, and and the whole methodology behind it it was is an approach that some of the democrats used to try and turn uh trump voters and uh, and what you realize is when you actually have conversations with people and you understand what their fears and concerns are um you realize that actually we're not that miles apart in terms of the things that we're worried about in terms of the often the things that we care about um and actually having that conversation and engaging with people um in a safe way overcome the polarization as well i imagine absolutely absolutely and and we've got a we've got a fight you know i work with a lot of um, organizations and within organizations a lot of organizations have been doing uh for example anti-racism training the ones that go terribly are the ones where somebody comes in and tells everybody that they're racist um, yeah. and kind of doesn't <laughs> Because who give wants them, to be told that? <laughs> again, it doesn't give them that space to kind of yeah. learn and to be vulnerable. The best anti-racism trainings are the ones where everybody is given a safe space. And sometimes that means, you know, engaging with white staff separately to, to people of colour, where everybody's given a safe space and you work through what their concerns are, what they're worried about, what they're worried about not saying or getting mm-hmm. wrong. Um, you get them to unpack their privilege in, in, in a safe space. And by the end, people kind of get it. Like, yeah, okay, this, this stuff actually kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. But you've got to invest that work and you've got to invest that time. So I would, you know, I'm almost pushing towards saying, you know, there needs to be this mm-hmm. um, almost kind of some kind of truth and reconciliation approach to some you know to to, to really unpack and say yeah. we're not unique in the world as having a difficult past we're not the only country that has a difficult past we are we've got our own specific difficult past how can we take that move forward with a much more positive vision of what it means to be british in this country um and i think we can do that but we need to have addressed those those past issues mm. I I'm listening to what you're saying about the anti-racism training, and I'm and I've and I'm worried that it's it doesn't sort of answer this uh, sort of right-wing concern of like being uh, talked down to, or um, you know, oh, we we all need to be re-educated, or you know, these these uh, anti-racism campaigners like they think they know better than us. I just wonder, you know, is there a, is there a middle path? through which you can say, yes, racism is definitely wrong, structural injustice exists, and there's things we can do about it. And at the same time, say, you know, actually, the UK can be a great country. Uh, you know, we we know that you're kind of scared of being talked down to, you're scared of being uh, marginalised in, in your own country and scared of saying what your views are in case they're the wrong views. How do you know? Do you can you see a way to to so that everybody can kind of get what they want? I do, I do, but I think, um, well, whether or not I can, see, you know, we'll always live in a, in 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 a world where and in a country where there are there are opposing views on on a whole bunch of things. I guess the uh i i guess the 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 challenge is how do you make the positive case and the positive mm-hmm. vision for why it is important that we address these issues and that's the thing that i think is missing mm-hmm. one of my criticisms of some of the ways in which actually not even sort of campaigners or activists one of the, how organizations talk about mm-hmm. issues of race and racism is that they're treated fundamentally as problems as opposed to 
taking that step of going, yeah, it is a problem. But actually, if we sort it, this is why it's better for everybody. Because mm-hmm. um, you, a... yeah, you need to bring these people along with you. And I, I'd be really keen to hear more about what your positive vision uh, for Britain looking forward might be and how you might try to take these people with you. And, and, I, and the thing, there's a, there's a really interesting book, which I can't remember the name of uh, right now, but it's it's by an American um, author who talks about the ways in which, for example, racism has, um, you know, significantly um, uh, impacted and negatively impacted white communities in America. And the way in which she, she, she gives the example of the public swimming pools, that because... Um, uh, the orders were made for public school for public swimming pools to be mixed white communities stopped coming to to public schools and then they all got defunded so now there are no you know there're virtually no public swimming pools in um in america they they were they rather they were they were defunded in in the round and that was just a classic example of actually wow. if we could find a way of it's you know racism costs us all but i don't think that case is often made as as, as strongly enough um but I think I think we we do need to provide those spaces. They do need to be safe. They do need to be really, really well facilitated. Mm-hmm. And the I think the key thing is really setting out where we're trying to get to. Like, as, so this is not about us saying we're going to have a process where we're just going to explain to everybody why this is a terrible country to be. Mm-hmm. No, the purpose is so that we can get collectively. Even on one level, we can get collectively to an identity where everybody can feel like they belong in this country. And we can't do that unless we acknowledge what's gone well and what's not gone well. And by the way, everybody has an opportunity to contribute to that and what they think. Yeah. Let's take all of that, let's think about it, and then let's move on. I mean, that kind of thing really resonates with me because... Uh, part of uh, something which is really important to me is the the idea that not everybody in uh, the UK gets the same opportunity. Some people have privileges, other people don't. Uh, privileges can be things like you know you went to a private school or you got into Cambridge or you know any any number of things. But I really feel like there's a duty on uh, people who get those privileges to make sure that people who didn't aren't disadvantaged by that because. You know, I, I think there's lots of people who could have got into Cambridge but didn't for whatever reason. Uh, not because they weren't as smart, but maybe just because they didn't get the opportunities early in life that would have enabled them to get there. And that costs the country. You know, that's, uh, you know, that person could have done just as well as I could have had they had that opportunity. And that would be better for everybody. So, I mean, I think that argument's got real potential. Uh, I mean, are you seeing anyone start to make that argument? Not really at the moment. Mm. Not, how does, and... how does that make, you know, what does that make you think? <laughs> I don't really see anyone making that argument, but... I... And, and I'm not entirely sure that there is, you know, in... in when we when we work with organizations about taking on big change processes you talk mm-hmm. about either you know the burning platform and creating that sense of urgency what what is a real sense of urgency at the moment people just seem quite happy to kind of get entrenched into their positions um but i also think there's there's potentially particularly from the labor point of view there's an electorally uh beneficial reason for 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 taking this approach because labor's coalition of voters mm. i think is, is is becoming structurally weaker um and you're going to lose your kind of younger voters if you're not prepared to take thing, these issues on yeah. but you're going to lose your older voters if you come across as if you're not listening to them and, and you're talking talking down to them and that's why i think it's 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 a reason for it that there's a there's a great responsibility on 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 leaders because i in a sense i think it's i think it's a bit unrealistic to expect a 20 year old kid <laughs> to kind of find the skills and the talent to have a sort of a nuanced mm-hmm. deep 
safe conversation with somebody who might turn out to say some really you know bigoted things you know what i mean but yeah. i think that we can expect that from our leaders to be bringing those sides together and in a sense sometimes um uh, those who, who are vocal are, are helpful in kind of creating that sense of urgency to to, to bring people together but it's difficult it's it, it's really hard and it what it's going to require the reason why I, I say i don't really see it is because i, I think in general there's a pretty there's a pretty um We've got a real dearth of leadership at the minute. Um, yeah. You know, the late, the current Labour leadership, for example, are very nervous about polls, very nervous about focus groups and about kind of, you know, making mm-hmm. sure that they listen to, you know, quote, unquote, what people are saying as opposed to, you know, taking some real leadership stances on these issues. So I think it, it just requires a different calibre of leadership to really sort of ask the real fundamental questions about what this country is about and what these yeah. nations are about. and um, and for people to feel safe that that person can kind of take them or those people, that coalition of people can kind of take them through that, mm-hmm. through this journey. Cause I think it's a, a, you know existen- existential. It sounds like we haven't really got that leadership talent yet. And um, that's something that really worries me, but even more so what worries me is that I don't even think that we've got enough uh, left wing voices who are able to grapple with those issues themselves mm. And definitely not to say them publicly, and definitely not to actually engage in debate with the with the right wing voices that are are making so much so many sort of worrying noises about all of these culture wars. I mean, you don't see uh, the likes of Jordan Peterson or Andrew Neil on GB News uh, really engaging with a proper intellectual uh, response from the left. Um, you know, is, is that just me or? Um, you know, I imagine that if I don't know about it, then probably it doesn't exist. But, no, um... I, don't, I don't think it. I think, as I said, I think positions are becoming more and more entrenched. The other thing, the other thing, is that in some cases, you not only do you become entrenched, but you become um, <laughs> it becomes commercially, you know, the right thing to do to to keep saying the things that you're saying because that's what your followers and, and, and people people expect. Yeah, um, I've been wondering about this question, sort of who benefits from kind of stoking the culture war uh, angle. Yeah. And yeah, it, it seems to me you're right. You know, the algorithms really respond to followers like getting a, a, a message over and over and over again and keeping coming back for it. Yeah. Um, because then you can turn those people in, into an audience and an audience which will buy stuff from you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that is it more complex than that? Is there any other sort of angle to it that you can see? I think that's right. And I think particularly from the newspaper point of view as well, that's mm. a similar thing. You know, this stuff sells and that's why they keep banging on about it. Um, and that is, that, is a, that is a problem. But I think mm. fundamentally it's weakening. Um, it's... It, it's creating an environment where, um, you know, frankly, a, a lot of young people, on the one hand, don't feel pride in in in, mm-hmm. in the country <laughs> because yeah. we haven't acknowledged the past, and on the other hand, you've got a whole bunch of people who do, and don't understand why the other side don't, and and feel um, very threatened by it as well. I get the impression. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and so it's it's a real, it is a real, it is a real issue. But look, I do th- I do think it is I do think it is possible. Um, I do remain optimistic about it. And as I said, you know, my thinking is that it will be led by government. History tells us that it probably won't. <laughs> there'll, there'll be other forces <laughs> that will that will that will force and, and push this conversation to to, mm-hmm. to happen. Um, but if we don't get it right, yeah, there's a real risk that. The polarization just gets beyond the point where you could even, you know, turn people around to to have this mediated conversation. Is this kind of an uh, making the argument that more young people should be trying to go into politics and and actively trying to change things from the inside in the same way that you know you talked about the personnel at Jesus College changing the new uh, the new master? Um, is that kind of what's what's needed should more people go into to politics is that something you're considering um, <laughs> um look i think you don't have to answer young... that last bit <laughs> i just know that in there 
<laughs> no, I do think. Look, I do. I would always say that more young people need to go into politics. Um, absolutely. Um, I think there'll still be a, quite a long lag before that translates into this sort of thing being resolved. So I, I wouldn't want to rely on young people to 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 lift that. Whether or not I will, I don't know. Mm. That's we'll have to see. Certainly not in the immediate future. Um, yeah, it's, it's part, always yeah, better part, to, to work a real job, I think, before uh, yeah. going into politics. So, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but also, it's you know, just looking at it, it's like, well, it, it's partly because of this, you know, where we are in this conversation. It's just sort of where where would you even start, you know, in this kind of mm. post? And we haven't even talked about um, a potential, you know, new monarch in. Uh, it, it's sort of five to ten years. Um, a, a monarch who would epitomise, you know, all like if, if you were to sort of create a caricature of, of all the things that you know your typical kind of left wing person would would be against. Um, kind of a old white guy who was literally born into privilege. Mm-hmm. With you know, and, and was just born into that role, and all of a sudden is is the king of the nation. I don't think we've really come to realize what what that's going to mean, what that's going to look like. I, mm-hmm. you know, that is the moment that I'm concerned about in terms of where this debate is going to go. Because oh, no, that's, that's the large... that's so, and that's the first time I've heard that. But it makes it makes complete sense. I mean, I'm I'm recording this up from from Scotland, where I think people have. You know, a passing interest in the royal family, but not really much more. But um, from my time in England, like, yeah, I mean, it's the mon- it's, what it's, happened in the monarchy does matter. It is much more relevant. <laughs> it's it's going to be a it's going to be you know if we haven't come to terms with some of this stuff, it's going to be a, a, a real you know nightmare situation because you know quite a, a big proportion of the country would say. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to sing God Save the King. A whole another bunch of the population would be holes with it. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could we could deal with the Queen because she was like the sort of uh, you know, nice old grandmother who has always been there. There's been, you know, there's she's been <laughs> unquestioning. And she also is like relatively benign, doesn't really get in, interfere with stuff, mm-hmm. just is, you know, is the Queen, just a fixture. A king? <laughs> that's like a whole different war game. Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting. And again, that's going to require some leadership to kind of get mm-hmm. the country through that, because I think that's going to be another d- and point. Do of you position. think Prince Charles's uh, views on climate change say, you know, he's quite pro trying to do something about climate change? Do you think that's going to be act in his defence, or is that going to make it any less worse? I don't think in terms of how binary these cultural war debates get, because if he, if he was, you know, a darling of the left because of those views, he, that he would be there already, and he's absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> um, at best, he's kind of ignored. So, um, I think that's going to be a really interesting moment, um, and it's going to happen relatively soon. And we're still, you know, in the shadow of Brexit potentially. Um, We've got, you know, Scottish independence talk potentially on on the cards. It's growing in Wales. Who knows what's happening in Northern Ireland with, you know, Mm. the impact of Brexit there. So it's a real, real, I think we will look back at this period and say, you know, if, (laughs) assuming we get through it, we will look back at this period and say, gosh, this was a time when this was not a country that was at ease with itself. Mm. Um, And, and, you know, how how do we get through that? It's going to require... A couple of people to to really to really push some buttons to get us through. Mm-hmm. I hope people will also look back on this period and go, "Well, there are some really great podcasts that were getting made at the time about <laughs> all this stuff." Um, now, maybe that's a, a good um, sort of note on which to to end on. And I always end by asking if there's a particular book which you think people should go and read, uh, which is relevant to what we've been talking about, something they might uh, sort of learn from, or if they want to go a little bit deeper. Sure. Um, I would pick um, uh, The Anarchy. I just finished reading it by uh, William Dalrymple. Um, and it's uh, it's about the rise of the East India Company in um, uh, in, in India, in, in pre-slash-colonial um, India. Uh, fascinating 
fascinating book. Um, and I, I'll just say one one of the bits that I found really interesting about it, there's often the argument used in the whole culture war debate that you can't judge the actions of people in the past. It was a different time. They were held to different moral standards. You, you know, everyone was a slave trader at that time, blah, blah, blah. You can't accuse them of the past. But what I find really fascinating is when, at the time of the East India Company, um, there was a huge um, trial, a couple, well, several trials in London um, or and impeachments of people um, because of atrocities that had taken place in India at the time. And London was in absolute uproar at the idea that British people were going over there and, and completely um, pillaging the place. Um, so, it, you know, at the time, there wasn't a consensus view that, oh, no, this is all fine. That has <laughs> changed, ebbed, you know, and, and come at different times. You know, it's a very, very simplistic look at the past. So I definitely recommend that book. It's a real fascinating retelling of mm-hmm. of, of that time and, and, and really explains how it was that the British established a foothold in, 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 in that continent. Well, I'll I'll put a link to that book in the description, so if people want to check it out, it sounds really interesting. And I would say, thanks. You've been an absolutely wonderful guest. So um, yeah, all all the best to you. Thanks, thanks, Zach. Good to be here.